Welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Heather Isveron, and with me today is Dr. Philip Zimbardo, one of the world's foremost researchers in psychology, distinguished faculty member here at the Naval Postgraduate School, and Professor Emeritus at Stanford University. Welcome, Doctor. Welcome, Heather. Today we want to talk about heroism yes. and your new research project with it. In terms of public safety and homeland security, can you tell me a little bit of the background? Yeah. Um, let me start off by defining what I mean by heroes and by heroes. Um, one of the main focuses that I've been trying to promote is to say heroes, most heroes are ordinary everyday people. The heroes that we know about, like Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, we know their names because they've organized their whole life around sacrifice to a cause or to people. Most people who do heroic deeds are ordinary people who typically do a single heroic deed only because to be a hero you need an opportunity. You need war, you need evil, you need disaster, you need corruption. And so what I'm trying to do is promote the notion that any of us could be a hero if we are willing to act on behalf of other people in need or a moral cause, knowing that there is a potential personal cost. You could get hurt, you could die in the extreme. In many cases, um, you, you could be ridiculed, uh, you could be seen as a deviant, a fanatic, um, and you never do it with expectation of a reward. Okay? Now, altruism is heroism light. I mean, you do something for other people, you give a contribution of blood or money to charity, but there's really not a cost. And I also want to separate heroism from celebrities. You know, somebody who wins the gold medal at the Olympics, people, the nation is proud of him, his mother is proud of him or her, but it's really not heroic in this sense. So heroism is also an action, so it always begins with an action in which the me is transformed into the we. It's about giving up egocentrism for sociocentrism. It's a focus on what can I do for other people in need. So my concern has been, I, I've been at Navy Postgraduate School teaching since 2002. My concern all along on the war on terrorism is, first the phrase, if it's a war, wars can be won or lost. And what's wrong is the label. It's, you can't win a war on nouns. Like we, couldn't, we can't win the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on terror. Terrorism is really a global challenge that every citizen has to be involved in because it won't go away. It's here to stay. You hate to say that, but in fact, it is the reality. You can't win a war on terrorism because there's no one to surrender. It's not a nation a state. It's the asymmetry between our nation or other nations and networks of, of terrorists, networks of people who have a different fundamentalist view of religion or, or ideology. Uh, and so, really what has to happen now, we have to involve ordinary citizens in this challenge. Not only to, to be prepared, to be alert, and also to be willing to make sacrifices. Not simply to the irritation of, of going through security at the airport. You know, terrorism to come is going to come on the subways, it's going to come on trains, it's going to come on school buses. So we really have to broaden our, uh, our appeal to all citizens to say, this is the challenge for all of us. It's not the challenge of homeland security, the challenge of you know, people in, in, in high places. That what is needed really is every citizen to see this is part of my duty, to be concerned, to make sacrifices on behalf of this cause. So what makes a person do something heroic versus doing something evil versus doing nothing at all? That's a wonderful question, Heather. See, relatively few people do evil. Relatively few people are heroic. Most of us do nothing most of the time. <clears throat> I think it's because every mother says, don't get involved, mind your own business. And if you do that, you live a long time and you pass on those, you pass on those passive genes to your, <laughs> your kids. Um, and so the key is, how do you get that mass of people not to go toward the hostile imagination, and instead go toward what I call the heroic imagination. How do you get, starting with young people, how do you instill in them the notion that I am a hero in waiting? To be a hero, a big hero, you need the opportunity, as we said, some, some challenge, some evil, some war. But while you, so 
what we want to do, we're developing a website where people around the world can go on and say, I, Phil Zimbardo, Heather, age so-and-so from this country, from Monterey, from San Francisco, pledge to be a hero in waiting. And while I'm waiting, I'm going to be a hero in training. So it's not enough to wait around. And that means every day I'm going to do a small heroic act. And while you're in training, you have to learn lots of skills. Because sometimes you have to know first aid skills. We tell them where to get it. Um, you have to learn leadership skills. You have to learn influence skills because most heroes are effective in networks, not alone, not solo heroes. You know, we have this notion from Joseph Campbell of the hero's journey. These are always male warriors. Well, that's, that's a false image. It's, it's dramatic and classic. Most heroes are ordinary people. I mean, our housewives are, you know, are, you know, businessmen, are shop owners. Joe Darby, the guy who stopped the abuses at Abu Ghraib, was a private in the Army Reserve, which is like in the lowest level, you know, in, in, in the military system. He sees these horrendous pictures of what his buddies are doing to Iraqi prisoners. And he, he takes the CD and he gives it to a senior investigating officer and sir, you know, this has to be stopped. It, it's, not, it's not right. We're supposed to be bringing dignity and freedom to these people. We're humiliating them. And he knew doing that was a high cost. In fact, everybody wanted to kill him, not only in his battalion, but in his hometown where he was seen as a snitch. Mm. He had to be put in protective custody for three years and then his mother and his wife. So he was seen as the snitch rather than the hero. But in fact, he saved people's lives by, by intervening, knowing again, that there's this high cost. But again, I want to say he's an ordinary guy, not special. There's no, typically when somebody does a heroic deed, you look back and they have never done a previous one before. It's something about that situation, that moment catalyzed them to take action when most people did nothing. The young man, Wesley Autry, who um, a 50-year-old African-American instruction worker is standing on a subway in New York, on City College, 137th Street. A white guy falls across the track. There's 75 people on a the platform. They freeze. They do nothing. He's got a reason not to be involved. He's got his two daughters with him. Instead, he turns to strangers, says, take care of my kids, jumps down, puts the guy between the tracks rather than across the tracks so he would be cut in half. The train goes over him. Them, there's a half inch clearance between the top of his head and the bottom of the train. Another half inch, he would have had his scalp cut off. And so, and he, he said, you know, it was no big deal to, to jump on the tracks. I did what anyone could do, but I did what everyone ought to do. So that's the moral imperative is to say, I am risking my life, that's the extreme, in the service of other people with the hope that I set an example that other people will do that for me. Uh, so this was the Christians in, in, the, in the Holocaust who helped Jews. Anyone caught helping Jews would be killed and your whole family. And people were saying, I have to do it. And so the whole idea I'm trying to develop with, with, uh, with developing this project called the Heroic Imagination Project is how do we inspire people around the world to move toward the heroic imagination rather than the hostile imagination. Because heroism is the main antidote to evil. To the extent that we promote heroism in kids from kindergarten on in our society, we move them for even thinking about the negative to the positive. We, think of, we get them to think about how I can help, what I can do for other people. And it really is moving egocentrism to sociocentrism. So heroes really transform me and too much in American society and other societies, it's about me. And the focus is on we. So when kids sign up to be a hero in waiting, there's going to be a whole bunch of projects they can sign up to be a health hero. You save somebody's life, you get them to stop smoking or cut down. So they're going to sign on. I'm going to get my father to stop smoking and cut back. I'm going to get my friends. I'm going to get them not to take drugs. I'm going to get them to do regular medical checkups. I'm going to see that, you know, my friend, a buddy, parent, spouse, uh, does the physical rehab, you know, uh, after surgery. Um, and then they can form groups of, of other kids who are trying to do the same kind of thing to give them support. Uh, eco heroes are kids who are taking the environment back from the elders who are destroying it, you know, to get people to um, uh, conserve, to recycle, conserve water to recycle. Um, we're starting a program, Tech Heroes. High school kids are going to go to elderly care centers to teach the elderly how to use the internet to develop their own website. Um, 
They can use it to get medical diagnoses. They can watch movies. They can play bingo. Just giving them now the, the freedom that this technology gives them. And at the end of this, the kids are going to develop hero stories from the elderly to a video uh, interview as well as stories about who are their heroes in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and essentially getting people to think have you ever done anything heroic meaning made a sacrifice on behalf of others knowing that it could be a cost and with, and you did it not for reward <clears throat> and then the ultimate thing we'd like to do with our project is <clears throat> to develop what I'm calling the encyclopedia of heroes like a heropedia modeled after Wikipedia where in one place we have all the heroes, the pictures and stories of all the heroes that ever existed, all the classic ones, but everybody in the world will submit their heroes, their family heroes, their, their heroes in the neighborhood. And we, we hope to get curators in every nation who will vet these, translate them into English, but also we'd have them in the native language, in Croatian, in, in Portuguese, in Spanish, in German. But because it's on the web, that means you can search by, I want to see all the women heroes that ever existed. I want to see all the kid heroes. I want to see all the controversial heroes. So Columbus was a great hero until recently. There's new evidence that he and his men did terrible things to the native. But we'd have the pro and the con, because the concept of heroism itself is interesting. Because sometimes uh, you're a hero to some people and not. So the, one of the great heroes of the world is Alexander the Great. He's <laughs> the only one that has that name. But if you go to some places, he was a villain because he destroyed some cities to take their resources to give them to other cities. So if you go in one city in Turkey, he's Alexander the Monster. You go to the other cities, Alexander the Great. So essentially, by having this encyclopedia of heroes that's easy to search, we think it'll be both inspirational. People will say, hey, anybody can be a hero. And also aspirational to say, and I could. And I could, I could do it too. And I'd like my picture up there. So the other things we're trying to do with the Heroic Imagination Project is to develop a research agenda, survey research, interview research, experimental research. The most amazing thing I've discovered is there's almost no empirical research on heroism. I've been studying evil for 40 years. We know a lot about what makes good people do bad things. We know almost nothing about what makes ordinary people do good things. Uh, and so we, we want to do research, we want to stimulate other people to do research. If we ever get enough money, we, we wouldn't want to even fund this research. And we're developing educational courses, both in school. We started in the fifth grade in, in Lansing, Michigan, in inner city schools. Matt Langdon, who's one of our team, has been doing this for three years. And now what we have to do is develop m metrics, measurable outcomes, so we can say, you know, before we, we, before we give our products away for free, we want to be able to say, and it works. Here's what, here's what changes in the kids, in their families as a consequence of this. And then we're going to do it in high schools, we're going to do it in, in colleges, and we even want to do it at, at the level of executive leadership. Right. Heroic transformation. It's not enough to be a good hero. You really should aspire to be a heroic hero uh, or have, have the people work for you think of you that way. Um, and then we're going to the Encyclopedia of Heroes. And the last thing is ultimately to get into the media, to have ordinary hero reality shows, ordinary hero cartoons, ordinary hero games. You know, there's this program Heroes, which was very popular. You know, they get invisible, they, <laughs> they fly. Well, it's just like Superman, Spider-Man. These are false heroes for the kids because they have special talents, fictional ones, that the kids can never have. But you want to say, no, most heroes are ordinary people who have nothing special about them. They can't fly, they can't be invisible, they can't read minds. And therefore, you could be a hero, too. Well, I think the greatest challenge for this particular project is getting the masses who don't do anything. I mean, right. What does the research say about that? Is there enough research? No, we don't know. See, and that's, I'm saying, again, that's the interesting thing is, so, you know, on that subway in New York City, there's 76 people, this Wesley Autry and the others, you know, could we have predicted that he would be the hero and they wouldn't, knowing everything about his personality? And we don't know that. So we can't even say what makes somebody behave heroically. All we know is after the fact, he did it and they didn't. Uh, and the point is you want to be able to, you, you'd love to be able to say what we're going to do is the next time that happens, maybe half of those people would say, let's help. Or, you know, when he jumps on the tracks, people would, would go to help him. Right. Now, 
another way he could have dealt with it, in fact, there was an interesting case shortly after that where somebody fell on the track, a guy jumped down, he, he calls for help, picks the guy up, and they take him out rather than he risks his life putting him down. So again, so that's, that's developing this network of right. getting other people involved. So that, that's what we want to spread, a little, a little social goodness. And so, you know, I've been, I've been dealing with evil since I was a little kid. I grew up in poverty in the South Bronx. And if you grew up in the inner city, you're surrounded by evil, of drugs and prostitution and, and, and crime of all kinds. Um, and as a kid, I always said, what made my good friends do bad things? And I always wondered what made some kids not to resist the temptation, you know, and, and the thing that focused me most, most recently on, on heroism is in 2001, uh, in October, shortly after 9-11, I was the president-elect of the American Psychological Association, and I went to New York to work with uh, firemen in the Brooklyn Heights Fire Department. They were, the one, they were the, maybe the first on the scene because they came right over the Brooklyn Bridge to, to the World Trade Center. And so I, I work with Ellen McGrath and other psychologists to set up uh, therapy, free therapy programs for their families and then for the, some of the firemen. Um, One-stop shopping center, we had lawyers and, and accountants because many of these uh, the widows had, had, you know, no will or they had no wills there. And I was so impressed with these firemen who were ordinary guys who made these enormous sacrifices, worked long hours, worked on this pile, you know, without masks, uh, risking their lives, finding body parts of their buddies. Seven, seven firemen from this one fire department died. And so when I was president the next year, I honored one of these firemen, Richie Murray, as symbolic of, of all the firemen in, in Brooklyn Heights, but in, in, in New York. And this guy told me, he said, we're big heroes now, next year nobody will remember us, hmm. you know. And so for here, so essentially my whole project is, how do we give voice to the nation's quiet heroes? That's what Obama said about his grandmother when she died, but you know, there are quiet heroes in every family, in every community. And so the Heroic Imagination Project says, what can we do as a nation and as a, as a world to give voice to those quiet heroes? Uh, and that's, so that's my mission for the, for the rest of my life. I've given up evil, <laughs> and now I've, <laughs> crossed the line. I've crossed the line to, uh, hopefully, to the side of moral courage. Well, it also sounds like the, the project is so important because it builds a culture of preparedness in a, in a, in a psychological way, and hopefully oh, right. building yeah. outcomes from that. Exactly. So, so that's essential uh, in, in, um, you know, in the challenge of terrorism. It's the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. I was, I was a Boy Scout for, for many years as a kid. <laughs> uh, but essentially, it's, it is a culture of preparedness. So if you say, I'm a hero in waiting, that means psychologically I am prepared to act when the opportunity arises. It may not arise, but if it does, I'm going to be like this little Chinese kid, Lin Hao, uh, who we saw in the Olympics, who was nine years old. Uh, he was in Sichuan province when this huge earthquake, 7.8 Richter scale earthquake, demolished his school. He survives and he's running away and he sees two of his classmates still there. He runs in and pulls them out, saves their life. And people said, why did you do that? You risked your life. He said, I was the whole monitor. It was my job to help my classmates. So that's the heroic imagination is that, you know, he could be, most kids are whole monitors the rest of their life. That's not going to happen. But when it does, if you're psychologically prepared, then what I'm predicting is you will act when other people who are not psychologically prepared will do nothing. They'll say, it's either not my job or they'll freeze. Right. right. So, so essentially what, what we really want is in, in the whole homeless, uh, homeland security orientation is for every citizen to say, you know, I am a citizen prepared to take action against terrorism should it occur, or should I see the possibility of it? You know, so that I, if I'm on that airplane and somebody is doing something unusual, I will take action. I won't wait for the staff. I won't wait for the, for the attendants. Uh, or better, I will yell out and get other people as well. So again, I really want to argue against the solitary hero. And we want to replace that notion with the hero ensemble, a hero network. The Christians who helped Jews who were most affected had to form a network because they had to move the kids around from place to place. If you were the only one and you got caught, 
not only did you die, but all the, the kids you were trying to save die. The Underground Railroad, you know, was in that work. You know, when, Nelson, when, when Martin Luther King died, civil rights continued because he had created a network. So it can't ever be about a person, an individual. Um, but again, to do that, you have to have social skills. So again, in our, when you're here in waiting, we will teach you on the web basic social influence skills, Cialdini's principles of persuasion in social science. Well, we truly look forward to seeing how this project evolves, and I really thank you for your time today. Oh, thank you. I hope I'll come back next year and say, hey, look, we did A, B, C, and D. And Can't wait so. for that. All we need is a little funding. Hello out there, a little funding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks thank again. You. Thank you.